presents indeed opportunities, but also challenges. And today we have a lineup of speakers that is quite impressive, including a uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Ecuador, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Luis Gallegos, the Honorable uh, Mayor of Malaga, His Excellency Don Francisco de la Torre, uh, and of course, um, uh, Ambassador Ferruki, Dr. Carla, and uh, representative of the Argentinian mission, um, Ms. Maria Florencia. Um, uh, without further ado, I would like to share with you some um, short presentations, some slides that perhaps will put in context what has happened with the COVID and where we are now. Julia, please. Very sad for me to read these numbers. I do remember that in mid-March, when this webinar series at UNITAR started, literally on the 16th of March, we had 165,000 cases and everyone was convinced that the COVID pandemic will uh, perhaps take two, if not four months and will be over uh, by the summer. That was not the case. As so of yesterday, we have 44 million and 2,000 with three persons as confirmed cases. And very sad indeed, 1,167,988 persons that have died. Those numbers, uh, as you all know, and the news is relentless, have confirmed that indeed we have a second wave, a wave of the COVID. Next, please. That second wave that you can also see in this regional chart, it's exacerbated in Europe and in the Americas. The good news perhaps is that Southeast Asia has managed to control the pandemic and that the numbers are indeed decreasing. The numbers for Africa and the Western Pacific have always remained low and we celebrate those news indeed because Africa uh, at the beginning at least was seen as the most vulnerable public health uh, system as a whole. Now for Europe, Unfortunately, there are uh, waves of uh, lockdowns uh, in France, in Switzerland, in Germany. The case of Spain is very particular, but we have the Honorable Mayor of Malaga. I'm sure he will be commenting on that. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that this affects the vulnerable people the most. And because this uh, conversation is about aging, we all understand that amongst those vulnerable people, seniors and people above the ages of 65, and the like are more exposed. Next, please. I wanted to give you an overview uh, with just three or four slides of what is happening in the world when it comes to aging. Right after the Second World War, and these numbers are global, in 1955, the life expectancy was approximately 50 years of age, actually less. 47 to be exact, if you were a male in the year 1955. Today, uh, as of 2020, actually the 30th of June, we have surpassed 70 years, uh, specifically 73 years of age if you are a female, and you are expected to live around that. That is the average, an increase of approximately 20 years, mainly due to better living standards, better hygiene, better food intake, and especially because medicine has advanced uh, and made great progress. Next, please. If you take the global numbers and just go to Europe, the numbers in Europe confirm this. If you go to Africa, and I'm not going to, we don't have the time, unfortunately, or you go to uh, the Pacific or you go to Latin America, the numbers are not so optimistic, but we wanted to show you this chart because the global north, as some people refer to North America, um, uh, Southeast Asia, Japan, mainly the Koreas, uh, South Korea and Europe, the, the problem is very urgent. People are living close to 80 years of age, depending on the country that you see, and on average, definitely 77 years, as I mentioned before. That means that there is an increased pressure on the retirement schemes, pension systems. There is an increased pressure on the health systems. And more important than anything, 
demographics and economics are changing. Next, please. Now, from the global picture to the European picture, to the Swiss picture, and you are going to hear uh, from North Africa, from um, Brazil, from Argentina, from Ecuador, from Spain, but just to tell you, because we're sitting here in Switzerland, Switzerland is uh, also a confirmation to this uh, hypothesis that we are presented that the trend goes up. By the year 2030, and for us that year is very important because as you know, the United Nations have um, adopted with the support of 193 member states, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals, that that year, the year that we finish the second phase of sustainable development, we should be more than 8 billion people. And of those 8 billion people, one in eight will be over the age of 65. Next, please. I am not going to read this all because we are going to actually uh, talk uh, in deep about this thing, but just one paragraph to the right, the broader effects. Healthcare denied for conditions unrelated to COVID-19, neglect and abuse in institutions and care facilities, an increase in poverty and unemployment because of the pandemic, the dramatic impact on well-being and mental health as well, the trauma, stigma, and discrimination have exacerbated the vulnerability of people, uh, of older people. The issue of aging was important and urgent before the COVID, today is even more. Efforts for building back better, as our Secretary General Antonio Guterres postulates, must include the full diversity of people within the older persons category, in multiple roles they have in society should be observed, including as caregivers, volunteers, and community leaders. When a person retires from his or her career, it is not to be put in a secondary place because they can continue contributing to society. An estimated 66% of people aged 70 and over have at least one underlying condition placing them an increased risk of severe impact from COVID-19. That is the reality that we have as of today. Next, please. And to conclude, we will be talking today about the economic well-being of uh, senior people uh, under the COVID, the mental health, what happened with the responders, life issues of life and death, the vulnerability that they have, as I mentioned, and unfortunately, the, the abuse and neglect that we see. Next, and I think that's the last one. Indeed, I finish with this. The distribution by age and gender of confirmed COVID-19 cases. Uh, as you can see, the age that at the beginning was uh, very high at the top of that chart, now has uh, distributed better, but still the vast majority of people the, in males and females that have the COVID are above 50 or above 60. And there you have the numbers. And in the case of females, the more senior people, uh, women age 80 or, or older, are an increasing number out of the total 46,243. Next, please. Uh, yes, I mentioned this, so that should be. Uh, thank you, Julia. Very good. So with that introduction, what has happened with the COVID and uh, what uh, uh, makes urgent but also important uh, to talk about aging today. Now, I would like to offer the floor to His Excellency Minister Luis Gallegos, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Ecuador, and to a great honor, the Chair of the Board of Trustees of UNITAR. Excellency, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alex, for your warm welcome. It is my pleasure to be part of this timely discussion, sharing some thoughts in good company. Saludos especiales a, a Francisco de la Torre, mi querido amigo y alcalde de Málaga y presidente del directorio de Cipal Málaga. Mis respetos por una gran tarea que hace usted, mi querido Paco, eh, y que hace Cipal en este tema. Uh, greetings to Ambassador Faruqi, uh, the past president of the board, uh, who uh, I, I, I have a very, very, uh, very big friendship and admiration. And thank you to all the other panelists. 
my regards to the field in absentia, but uh, uh, please send him uh, the, my very time, uh, my uh, regards and for this timely event. Uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 has become a, fam a familiar reality for all of us. Sooner or later, we will all experience a new by firsthand or because of one of our closest relatives, friends or colleagues might face it in, in particular older persons. This is the first international crisis that the world has confronted that affects every nation in the world, but also affects every individual. This singularity brings a particular point of reference. If one, if oneself and one's family is in risk, it is the first time that we confront the challenge of unprecedented proportions, a challenge that has put on its knees the health systems, the economic systems, and the social fabric of our society. This is an impending dilemma. We have between the COVID and our economies a dilemma of proportion. We are finding that our, the solutions are not easy. As we look at Europe today and see what is happening in some of the countries in Europe with uh, better health systems than the rest of the world, with better systems of economy or more strengthened systems of economy, we see that the challenges will accompany us for a long time from here. It will be more than, year, than two years in which we can have the vaccine for all and uh, the, the, the medicines we require to surpass this challenge. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, aging doesn't distinguish origin, religion, ethnicity, and gender among other factors. It increases the risk of vulnerability for any person while also determining the development of a society as a whole. According to UN sources, the 2020 number of, of people aged 60 and older will, will outnumber children younger than five years. And over the next three decades, the number of older people worldwide is projected to more than double, reaching more than 1.5 billion persons in 2050. And 80% of them will be living in low and middle income countries. In the light of the intensive, intensifying pace of global population aging, discussions about the autonomy and care of older adults is a priority area. In this regard, it is important to underline the rights of older persons from the proactive role, thinking out of the box, where they are the main actors of their own destiny, fostering equal and adequate condition of, for development of their autonomous and independent life as needed represents an essential step toward their protection. In the framework of the current situation, COVID-19 has been felt by all, but older people have suffered the most. The direct and indirect impact of the illness of older persons have increased their vulnerability. In many of the pandemics before, when you had smallpox and disease related diseases, it was the children who were affected and the elders would take care of the children. Now it is inverse. The vulnerable groups apparently are more in the aging group than the others. In case of fatality ratio of confirmed cases raises to almost 73% of people between 65 and 80 years old, as Alex just pointed out in his chart. Similarly, the disruption of essential services, social and distancing measures, and the lack of care facilities has limited the social role that elderly people play in society, affecting their well being and mental health. Access to healthy and emergency services of non COVID 19 related process have been disrupted because of the pandemic. On one hand, this has been the result of, a, of health personnel and infrastructure relocation to provide COVID 19 relief services, but also due to the reduction of demand particularly in elective or preventive care. Although the, ur the urgency of such elective procedures is not immediate, periodical checkups and consultation can save lives, particularly in the case of older people. If you are scared of going to the hospitals because of COVID, you will leave, the, you will leave your care for the future. And this will affect the health of all. The economic impact of COVID-19 has been placed 
have placed a lot of burden on people reaching their age of retirement. On one hand, those who have lost their jobs will find it increasingly difficult to rejoin the workforce, considering age-related stigma and discrimination. In such cases, older persons may face financial difficulties, being forced to anticipate their retirement, their retirement or make use of their pensions in advance. At the same time, the social impact of physically distancing can make broader effects on the elderly, increasing vulnerability and neglect. For example, older persons living in situations in care homes have faced a growing number of mistreatment and neglect. Similarly, they can face higher risk of domestic violence and abuse. Social isolation can also increase depression and anxiety, creating physical and emotional impacts for the well being of older persons. This is increasingly true considering the social distancing directives that have been stricter concerning older people. Likewise, the intergenerational digital divide has become more evident because of the pandemic. Although current technology has served as tools for scrapping the reality of isolation and social distancing, many older people have limited access to these technologies and do not have the necessary skills to make full use of them. Similarly, visual and hearing impairments can add to such ob obstacles if not supported if, no, if support is not provided. While COVID-19 seems to have drawn a grim scenario, the perseverance and resilience of older people is admired. Their role in society has been prominent, not just as part of the health staff in the front line, but also as caregivers for their grandchildren during school lockdowns as the source of courage and patience for facing the pandemic. On, on the way forward, it will be indispensable to create mechanisms and institutions specializing in aging with the objective of, of assessing, providing all the necessary resources, data, information, and services to older persons. It has further evidence, the evidence issues in aging and intergenerational divide, allowing policymakers to consider a new commitment to the dignity and human rights for elderly, in particular when assessing the healthcare and labor markets and in prevention of the maltreatment and violence. The experience and contribution of older persons have in their communities placed them in a strategic position for the design and implementation of public policy. Ladies and gentlemen, the effective promotion and protection of older persons is the common goal that must be addressed in the comprehensive manner. While this issue has been included in the UN agenda for several years, it deserves to be strengthened through capacity building and experience sharing. In this regard, it is important to raise awareness of the potential and challenges of this group in the social, economic, political, and cultural aspects through the empowerment and visibility of their rights. In addition, in strengthening programs and public policies that can contribute to this endeavor. People should grow old, healthy, active, without distress, and with dignity. Therefore, taking on board the needs and capacities of older persons is a cornerstone for paving the way toward a more inclusive society, better for all, there will, and we will have finally reached that no one will be left behind. Alex, dear gentlemen, thank you very much for permitting me to participate in this very timely issue. It is, ta it is a timely issue, not only because of the numbers and quantity of persons that have been highlighted by COVID, but it is also a rights-based issue. This is human rights at the, at the ultimate I thank you very much for bringing this discussion to the foreline of our, uh, of our endeavors. And I trust that we will all contribute. And certainly I am, will be always available to work on this issue at the utmost of our capacity. I thank you very much for this opportunity and wish you the best during this, this event. Uh, thank you, Alex, for this very timely initiative. Thank you, Excellency. It's quite an honor indeed, and especially for such a holistic view that you just uh, share with us. Uh, indeed, it is, it is an honor to have a champion like you um, leading the charge uh, here. Now, uh, to hear also from, a, from another champion and a good friend of UNITAR, uh, someone that has made a difference when it comes to uh, bringing importance and attention, as I say before, to this very compelling issue. Allow me to offer the floor now to give us a perspective from Spain to the Honorable Francisco de la Torre, Mayor of the City of Malaga and Chairman of the Board of CIFAL Malaga. Excellency, the floor is yours. 
uh, you are still muted. Uh, the microphone. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, yeah. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, or good evening, perhaps. Uh, everybody, it's a pleasure, it's an honor uh, to participate with you, Mr. Alex Mejia, uh, with uh, Minister Luis Gallegos, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador. Uh, un placer, authentic placer, de veras. A pleasure also uh, to participate with uh, Ambassador Feruki, Ambassador, uh, that was Ambassador also People Republic, uh, Democratic Republic of Algeria, no? and also with uh, Carla da Silva and Florencia González from Brazil, uh, Argentina. Uh, uh, in Spain, we have now that it is statistic with uh, one million, one million, one million hundred thirty-six uh, thousand people uh, confirmed, confirmed case. No, uh, the statistic, the evolution, you can see in the second wave. Uh, is a moment more higher than the first. And the, the last uh, column perhaps is uh, no static complete because continuous increase. And now we have the increase each day is more than the day before, no? in all Spain. No? Uh, the, the, that uh, official statistic is 35,000. In fact, uh, uh, all the people seeing we have, uh, the number is higher perhaps. 50,000. Eh? The difference between uh, the normal statistics in other year and now is uh, 15 or 20,000 different. No? That is uh, the, the explication. No? Um, in general, in Spain, it's not the same uh, uh, affectation. No? In the north, uh, we, you can find Navarra, Rioja. The, the north of Spain is more uh, higher, the higher the, the statistics than in the south. Perhaps it's the climate, I don't know, or the, the question, the, but it is that. In Madrid now we, we have the incidence by 100,000 inhabitants, it's about 400, it's not higher. But we have in the north of Spain, one the 1,000 uh, incidence in the average of 14 days, 14 days. In, in Malaga we have now in 200, 200 incidence is uh, lower. lower. <clears throat> but uh, each day is uh, higher than the other day. No? Okay. It's necessary to uh, stop and to uh, share. You know? How in, in Spain, uh, the government opening uh, now three months of uh, uh, situation of uh, critical uh, alarm. No? But it's a possibility in each region, in each uh, regional government, to uh, make application for uh, close sun territory. Uh, in Andalusia, we have uh, eight provincias and three provincias, right. Granada, uh, Jaén, and Sevilla, is close uh, in relation to the other. No? But uh, that, that is one statistic now before of the uh, evolution of the uh, life expectancy. Uh, Spain is, is one of the countries with much higher life expectancy, similar to Japan, eh? uh, 81, 87, that is the, the before, is the exact. Eh? Uh, the evolution is very, very uh, continuous. No? Near uh, si, fi, uh, 86, uh, 7 and 81.3, uh, uh, the average 84. Now, with the last statistic of COVID, it's perhaps it's le less uh, high, no? No, because uh, the, the, the people with most age. Uh, that <clears throat> a little before <clears throat> that the normal evolution. No? And uh, the statistics of population, Malaga is the sixth population, the, the first is Madrid, the second is uh, Barcelona, the third is Valencia, uh, four is Sevilla, Zaragoza, and Malaga. Malaga is uh, near 300,000 inhabitants. Uh, the metropolitan area is one million, one million hundred thousand. Uh, the provincia is uh, one million uh, seven hundred thousand perhaps no? murcia etc etc no? in general spain is with equilibrium with balance in different uh, the, the distribution of the population in all the maples the, the, uh, the yeah I, I think uh, their friend the the important of this meeting this webinar is <clears throat> to to speak about uh, the one of the most important challenges that humanity have now no the shelling of aging uh, successfully uh, with success, no? uh, 
uh, is uh, that exactly in all the, uh, the country, the population uh, arrive in one age more high in general. Aging is uh, fact, but it's necessary aging with activity, with activity, no uh, continue addiction one year in your life, but uh, without continue, it's necessary to improve the capacity of activity, of aging, eh? uh, in position of active continue. You know? uh, it's, it's essential, it's essential uh, uh, incorporate in the uh, behavior of the people healthy habit. Not only in the last year, the healthy habit is necessary all the life in the 20, in the 30, in the 40, in the 50, always a little sport uh, spirit in the, in the life of the people in general. But in the, uh, at the um, time you have more age in your life, it's necessary to have more healthy habit. Healthy habit in a sport system, sport spirit, healthy habit also in the meat, in the uh, form of common. Uh, we can see, we can see uh, aging is a challenge, very important challenge uh, and not a problem. If you made well aging in general in your population, in your city, in your country, in the world, it's no problem that the people arrive a uh, night year in the future. It's possible to arrive the average of the people. But the question is to, uh, to be active all the life, continuous, in different position. Your activity in 60 is different in 70, and 80 is different, but you can continue. I, I, I know the advocate, uh, doctor in medicine, a professor, they continue activity. Some major continuing activity in 70 years, if you can, uh, see it's possible to uh, this, this anecdote, this possibility. No? In, in general, uh, health habit, uh, learning continuum, formation continuum, uh, continuum learning eh, is essential. Capacity of participation, that is, I think, in democracy, it's more easy to be agile because in democracy, participation. It's more easy that in uh, no democracy system. No, uh, I think that is a well good question. In safety also, uh, security for the people, safety for the people with age. With age. It's more easy, it's easier to uh, arrive at uh, one age, the 80 or 90, uh, 90 uh, if you have a new system, one city, one country with this. Uh, Failures uh, of aging, no? safety, participation, learning continues, a uh, healthy habit. Essential. Uh, in, in Malaga, we work in this way. We have uh, uh, a number of uh, um, uh, number of, of uh, building with the activity of the uh, people with age, with Malaga. aging, uh, the prevention for aging, uh, prevention in the question of uh, memory, of the, uh, the, the Alzheimer, etc. The possibility is on the, the work of memory. That is one of the best and more nice activity in our city uh, on this question. And, um, I like very much the possibility that you can find in the system of sport life. Sport life is working, while working, is day is day one hour at less uh, that is possible for two people all the people to to make that no now in the covid in this period of covid i i, I know uh, I, I see uh, that the, the people uh, have little uh, prudence uh, retraction no the similar activity less sport activity uh, it's necessary to have prevention uh, we in the, our building for the age people, age people, uh, the activity now is, um, one part is a virtual, telematic, uh, no presencial, it's normal. What is presencial, uh, we say in the street, uh, in the park, uh, under the sky, uh, in the light, in the wing, <laughs> open free. In our city it's possible to make that because our climate is very good, July, you know, you know 
this capacity the, the Malaga. No? But uh, I, I, I know, yeah, I am uh, with this uh, preoccupation, uh, this, uh, uh, to, to think about that, how did the best solution to improve, to, uh, to arrive a well static in capacity and in activity of the people in age, uh, the older people. No? The older people now in the period of COVID is, uh, what we say, a little scared. Scared, scared. perhaps, no? a little scared. No? Uh, it's necessary uh, continuous uh, uh, to, to be attention uh, for no uh, uh, con contact, no, no, uh, no, 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 no contagiar, no con con contagios. Con contagios, contagios, but uh, it's necessary to be in good position of activity. It's like the activity economic, it's necessary to balance the question for the health and the question for the economy, uh, the two policies. Um, we know, we know that the best system for to improve the economy is to arrive at the best number in health. Uh, the country today, I know the, the statistic of Taiwan. Taiwan is one of the best in the world. New Zealand also, Korea del Sur, South Korea, in Sudest Asia, Sudest, uh, in the number very good number, Mr. Uh, Alex Mejia, they are friend, very good statistic of the world. We can see now uh, that the number of the Asia is better than Europe, better than America, etc. No? Uh, we can uh, abstract uh, the resume. Uh, que Malaga is a city especially characteristic for to be a friendly, friendly city for all people. Now we work we have a good uh, system, a good uh, result, uh, with, but uh, we, we want uh, to best and call, to improve our capacity, our strategy, our policy for to be is day, is that year uh, the best city for uh, to be friendly city for all people. That is my position and my last message in that uh, webinar. It's a pleasure to be with you. I will be until four, four, 15 minutes in time of Malaga, time of Spain, because this afternoon you have one other question to very, very prosh, very nine, uh, near in the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very, very much for giving us a very fresh perspective from Malaga, from Spain, but also very much globally when it comes to the importance of having this holistic approach to the issues of aging and why people can actually indeed remain productive into their 80s and their 90s and so on. I'm going to do now something for with Minister Gallegos right before we introduce Ambassador Feruki. Bear with me just for, for, a, for a little while. I know that His Excellency Minister Gallegos has another very important meeting and I miss so much that he needs with us after uh, the, the allotted time in his busy agenda. There is one question, Minister, that I would like to present to you because your views will be very important. I know of your um, work with DESA at the United Nations in New York, about your work uh, leading uh, the process in the past uh, to get the CRPD, the Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And as you tell me over and over again correctly, all of us one day will be disabled, right? But um, the question, uh, we have uh, participants from all over the world. And there is one question, normally this is at the end, but allow me to do it now with the provision of uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Peruki. Mr. Andrew Larpent asked a very unique question that I'm going to read for you, Minister. He says, um, he's the chairman of the Commonwealth Association of the Aging Common Age. And he basically say that since, his question is as follows. Since World War II, Western countries have embraced and supported the concept of retirement. This gives society the impression that a retired person no longer have value in society, unfortunately true. So he's asking, is it time to retire the concept of retirement? Should we stop referring to people that have concluded their careers as retired? Excellency, please. Um, Alex, I, I think it's a very timely question. Um, I will exemplify this with, the, with, with uh, with Paco and me, uh, I think uh, in, 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 our, in both our cases, 
we continue to work very past our retirement age. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, in, in our societies, the value of experience is something that has to uh, be re revalued. The, 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 rapid, the, the rapidness, the executiveness, the immediacy of, of social media, of technology has uh, ruptured a concept of the need to, of reflection. I believe that, uh, uh, that these billion persons who are past 60 years old in the world uh, have a, a, a very important contribution to make. The societies they live in were accustomed to having them be part of a valued and wise advice. In many of our countries, in the agricultural sector, in the in the informal world, in, in, in those that uh, that that in, in both Latin America, Africa, Asia, and in all, in all the world, uh, being being an elder person has brought in some some part of equilibrium. Uh, but in the retirement, in economic sense has also meant that in many, in many societies, the retirement age was put at 65. You, you had a chart there uh, exemplifying that the normal age today for women would be 78 to 80 years old. If you do the following calculus, and it takes you 30 years of your life to be educated, it takes you to obtain your master's degree and obtain your PhDs in many cases, that 30 years, and you work for 35 years, you reach 65. And if you live until you 90, you have to have an economic support that will continue to make you uh, 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 and permit you to live with health, with health systems, with social systems, with backup systems until practically 85 to 90 years. This is, this is the dilemma. This is the challenge for our society. How do we return to make these people more productive without uh, being a threat to the younger people who are entering the job market? How do we create policies that complement one and the other? Uh, I think that it is, it is undoubtedly a demographic change that has not been looked at in its entirety. I also think that the human rights of these individuals have to be uh, acknowledged. We, Ecuador has just signed the Treaty of the Organization of American States on Older People. I think we should establish uh, uh, enforceable and, uh, treaties on the rights of persons uh, uh, that, uh, that are in the process of aging in order for them to have the, the, the viability of, the, uh, uh, of their rights. It is, a very, it is a very important question and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to answer it. And being a person who is aging, I think that we should be very careful in having those rights uh, defended and those rights uh, that have to be enforced for us and for the rest of these billion people who work, uh, who are in the aging process. Indeed, indeed, and I thank you for sharing so those thought, uh, thoughts. Indeed, it's a change of paradigm, as you say, and those perspectives on rights are also important. Uh, I wanna thank you, Excellency. I know that you will have to go soon, but uh, you wanted to stay until uh, His Excellency the Mayor will speak. I appreciate that, and uh, of course, feel free whenever the moment thank goes. You. Thank you very much, Alex. Please take care of yourselves and your family. It is the most challenging of times. Thank you very much and God be with you. Blessings to you. Bye bye. Very good. We continue with our webinar now with another perspective which is uh, very unique uh, from us because of who she is. Ambassador uh, Taos Feruki, an excellent friend of the United Nations, uh, particularly of UNITAR, as the minister just said, a former, our past president of the Board of Trustees and a very prestigious diplomat uh, representing the Democratic Republic of Algeria. Her last post as ambassador in Spain, a, a very productive life that continues. She has um, uh, shown us consistently in the past the importance of um, uh, putting forces and investment, uh, time and resources in issues of disabilities and aging. And she uh, motivated us 
to uh, put together uh, what is a uh, basic concept not but something that will uh, uh, hopefully uh, next year become something uh, real and will come to fruition soon with her help on what should be a global initiative on aging herself uh, minister gallegos and uh, um, uh, mayor de la torre have uh, led the process in conceiving what should we do as a multilateral uh, architecture when it comes to issues of aging but to hear her views in general about the People's Democratic Republic of, of Algeria and in general about uh, aging, I would like to offer the floor now to Her Excellency Taos Ferruki. Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alex. At the outset, I wish to express my deep appreciation to UNITAS, in particular to Alex Mejia and his team for organizing this webinar and welcome the prominent panelists among them uh, Minister Gallegos, to whom I wish the best, and His Excellency de la Torre, the mayor of Malaga, who is a fr good friend of mine. I, I can, I have this pretension to be uh, his friend. And also to my colleagues, the Dr. Carla and uh, Florencia, who is from, who will speak from New York to us. That my intervention will consist on three parts. The sad reality of the COVID, the impact of the inclusion of elders, and the international cooperation and the role of UNITAR. As you know, I am a very determined multilateralist on this way. Then, if we have the COVID showed the sad reality, the considerable gaps between performances of different countries and regions, particularly on health systems. It showed also the quasi-collapse of the socio-economic activities following the lockdown imposed by this unprecedented pandemic that severely impacted the world economy with an exacerbation of stress, uncertainties, and fears for the future. It showed also the absence of preparedness to face the myriad impacts of the pandemic in terms of communication, equipment, trained personnel, management support for assistance to victims, particularly elders. The isolation of all persons due to their vulnerabilities to the COVID, supposed to halt the spread of the virus, an approach that unhopefully resulted on the aggravation of their physical suffering and mental stress, including of the beloved ones. The widening of the gap on communication of national authorities with families, communities, local authorities, media, women, youth, NGOs, etc., with the risk of fragmentation of the social cohesion and the erosion of trust on democracy governments, democratic institutions as well. Now, I will turn to the, my, second my second part of the, my presentation, which is the inclusion of elders and its impact. It has an impact, of course, on the preservation of the socioeconomic cohesion, on the trust on democracy, governance, and democratic institutions. It has also an impact of or it will impact and it will need an adaptation of public policies to the structural change worldwide in which longevity is a key driver of population aging globally. If we speak, if I, I will just explain a little on social cohesion. As bridge builders between generations, elders have a key role in the preservation of the social networks and on the strengthening of the socio-economic socio cohesion, not only at the family level, but also at the community and the nationwide. Democratic values. Elders incarnate ethics and values of non-discrimination, respect, dignity, and solidarity. Therefore, their inclusion 
represent a long-term investment of the universal values that help, particularly in the context of post-COVID situation, help build peaceful societies and trust on democracy, governance, and democratic institutions while cementing the cultural and environmental diversity of humankind. Let's also talk about the adaptation to this structural change. My colleagues referred to this just previously. In fact, an adaptation of public policy is required to face a strategic change ahead, arising from the following elements, from the lessons learned from the tragic approach of the isolation of elders, who paid a high price to the pandemic. We will change also because of the growing number and proportion of old persons in the population worldwide. We need also change to face challenges and opportunities of the post-COVID situation. And for that to happen, we need international cooperation. And here we see the role of UNITA. A renewed international cooperation is essential to assist countries facing the profound changes in the aftermath of this pandemic. I hope it will happen soon. As part of the UN system, UNITAR is well suited to contribute to the future intergovernmental efforts through its 19 International Training Center for Authorities and Leaders, CIFAL, designed to help countries develop capacities for improving the well-being of their populations, particularly the most vulnerable. In this connection, I would like to refer to the UNITAR's Global Initiative on Aging, conceived as a concrete tool aimed at advancing the UN Agenda 2030, especially Sustainable Development Goal 16, which has three pillars by the fact, peace, justice, and strong institutions, building up peaceful and inclusive societies with the participation of elders. The early finalization of this innovative UNITARS project will certainly provide more pertinence to the UN cooperation, taking into consideration the growing needs and priorities of nations worldwide in the context of the post-COVID situation. In the meantime, this is my own opinion, I, I bring the uh, attention of my dear Meyer, because I will ask him something, <laughs> that an adequate location should be identified to give visibility to the very timely global initiative on aging on which UNITAR showed vision and leadership. As a renowned center of excellence of, on exchange of experience and the good practices, Sifal Malaga, in my humble opinion, could be the best place to host this important work. Undoubtedly, this innovative initiative will open new horizons for the international cooperation on a subject matter that is of universal interest. Thank you. Excuse me, my microphone is, is giving me trouble. But Excellency, I wanted to um, mention two things, uh, not before thanking you uh, for actually writing a very cohesive and coherent um, uh, uh, words, um, and also for mentioning um, what UNITAR can do, the agency that I represent. But uh, uh, two uh, issues that you have raised, and I'm sure uh, we will comment this later on in our proceedings. Number one, the need to renew policy urgently. I, I believe that is something that we should do um, as, um, as a matter of uh, uh, perhaps a strengthening of governance. I, I will put it as big as that. And second, the role of the elder. I love the, the way you use the word elder indeed, because that is what it is. It's a lot of experience, a lot of wisdom, that are uh, uh, things that are indeed important for society. So thanks so much uh, to Her Excellency Ambassador Feruki. And now we will continue um, with our uh, uh, proceedings. 
uh, listening from uh, two very important speakers bringing two uh, different perspectives, one from Brazil and one from Argentina. From Brazil, it is my great honor to uh, offer the floor to Dr. Carla da Silva Santana Castro, the president of the Brazilian Society for Genome Technology. Dr. Uh, Santana Castro, it is a pleasure for us to have you here with uh, uh, us. Um, and I have read about you, Bayou, and I can only say that it is quite an honor to get to hear what you have to say. The floor is yours. And you are muted. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mejia. Thank you for the invitation for this seminar, this, this webinar, and thank you the I'm greeting for the authorities and my colleagues, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about the impact of the COVID-19 to Brazil, to older Brazilians. And um, I have to say it's very important to us to talk about how the some points is affect the old population in Brazil. Um, so uh, please, Julia, thank you. Yeah, the major epidemics and their impacts to the population have challenged world societies. The world has dealt with the pandemic crisis caused the SARS-CoV-2 with implication for all sectors of the society, mainly the health sector, labor, financial market, demand of transport and social protection, education, leisure, well as the social structures. Please. Um, the national data point uh, shows that uh, 500, uh, 5 million cases of infected people with 159,000 deaths from SARS-CoV-2 with uh, a mortality rate in 712.0%. In Brazil, people over 66 six represent 69.4 of deaths. Those who had the least one comorbidity are almost two thirds of deaths, although under reporting case is admitted by health authorities. Please. Um, Next. The initial observation of COVID mainly affect the older people cause the pandemic to have strong for its existence impact for this group. Important aspect regarding the older population have been disclosed since the beginning of the pandemic in Brazil. Uh, three points uh, we choose to talk, the ages, the prejudice against the older people proved to be a, a new uh, to Brazil and the, the world. Brazilian health condition in the old age the complexity in handling the older patients with COVID imposed the chronic condition and comorbidity is the challenge, is a great challenge for the uh, health professionals. And the low number, a few number of older people accessing the internet, older people confining in their homes without access to health care services and family, friends, and due to difficulty to using the, the internet and technology. Next, please. Um, we are gregarious <laughs> beings uh, by nature, surviving only in the groups, and to expect the rupture of daily living and the social distance in periods of crisis will have a great impact on individuals. Although the social isolation is not new to the older group, but the impact is especially strong for them. The social isolation for the older people has long been a public health concern and should be on the public and family agenda due to the seriousness and urgency of this topic. The social distance disproportionately affects older people whose only social contacts outside at home. Older people who attend social centers, as a daycare, for example, which are closed indefinitely. Uh, elderly people who live alone and who have a small social support network, and older people who depend on the support of volunteer, religious, or social assistance, and uh, isolate older people who live in a remote area. Next, please. Uh, on the other hand, the desirable social distance to contain the transmission of the virus is affected by the precariousness of housing and the house conditions for many Brazilians living in vulnerable communities, in common shacks, in slums, and small houses, which many people live in. The relationship expressed by the lack of space 
in the precariousness of life bring the fear of falling to the COVID, for the COVID, in addition to the tension for becoming certain tragic uh, future expense. Uh, please, the next one. And the, the next topic is the digital inclusion of older people in Brazil. A significant part of Brazilian society is included in digital world, mainly through the mobile phones. Uh, the majority of the population access the internet. However, when uh, with the expressive increase of user, the exclusion category persists. persists. These are important aspects to understand the digital divide in Brazil. First level is inequality have access or not. Second level, inequality access, but with degrees of limitation. Uh, the survey about the use of internetly uh, shows that uh, about 34% of uh, older people use internet in Brazil. And the, this, uh, this point is very, uh, very stressful for the health professionals and the families and uh, the neglect in relation to the social isolation, old aid, mental health, and their digital literacy is not new for the older Brazilian ones, although the crisis has unveiled such condition. It is still lacks robust policies and to guarantee the state fair of our well-being and full life in old age. Urgent action is needed to mitigate the mental, physical, and social consequences for the social isolation that affect the older population in Brazil before, during, and after the pandemic. The current pandemic reveals the difference and the weakness in the world society. However, signs to the opportunity to construction of a society that is less exclusionary, less inequal, and more friendly to aging people. Next one, please. And uh, some lessons of pandemic to Brazil. Uh, the COVID surprised everyone and will change the world permanently. Combating ageism and tracking violence against older people needs to be on the agenda of Brazilian government and the society as well. Social police must be robust, long-term and aligned with the speed of aging of the Brazilian population. The digital divide must be overcome, and the digital literacy of older, most, most older adults must be a matter uh, of citizenship. The next one, please. Um, and recognize the demand of the older person can mobilize society and to make social change. Solidarity networks were developed during the crisis. Social distance made Brazil advance in the provision in distance care is not permitted in Brazil before the pandemic. So telemedicine, teleorientation, telecare is permitted now during the pandemic, just, but I think we can advance. The demand for communication through technology has made older people develop more basic digital skills. Digital uh, inclusion programs have been more frequent now care, physical activity, and leisure service, and leisure service expanded the offering at a distance and positively increased the reach. So we believe that we are moving. <laughs> um, thank you for this attention. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to you, Dr. Carla. Uh, very unique to see the perspective from Brazil. Uh, very important that you remind us that uh, there is a digital divide as well, not only the things that we have already discussed, but um, this uh, very discriminatory issue, because as you said correctly, yes. if an older person don't know how to use technology, it's even worse. So uh, something must be done about that. But uh, thank you again for taking this time. And before we go for last, uh, but not least, uh, very important panelists, uh, this is a very refreshing view that you're going to see very soon. I just wanted to also, you know, with your permission, uh, ask uh, for your patience and introduce a small uh, interruption because it is important to get to hear from Mayor de la Torre, uh, even if it is one more minute, Excellency, I know that you have to leave and I appreciate that you have actually stayed with us longer than expected, but uh, I will uh, indeed invite you to take the floor uh, to give us some concluding remarks before we continue, Excellency. 
Thank you, thank you, dear friend, Alex Mejia. No, I apologize because uh, I, I need to leave because uh, my, my agenda now in the afternoon is uh, very pressing also. No? But it was a pleasure and honor for me to participate in this webinar. No? Thank you because uh, all the level of the speech are very high, very interesting. I ask uh, Julian Radis with me now eh, mm -hmm. uh, to, to have the possibility to text a uh, uh, writer. And thank you, uh, the Minister Gallego. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Feruki. Uh, thank you for your uh, reference to, to Cifal Malaga in your speech. Uh, very interesting, uh, Carla da Silva, the question of Brazil also. No? Uh, I apologize especially with Miss Florencia Gonzalez because at that moment it's impossible for me to, to hear, but uh, Julia Andrade uh, told me about your speech. You know. Congratulations for this webinar. Very interesting, very important. Eh? You have uh, our collaboration always with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. I wish you an excellent day and thank you so much for giving us of your busy agenda and all these minutes today. I wish you the best. Thank, thank you. Goodbye. And we, uh, we will continue. We will continue now uh, with our last speaker uh, with a very different uh, perspective and uh, a very holistic one. Let me please uh, now offer the floor to Ms. Florencia Gonzalez, bueno, first yeah, secretary yeah, of the Permanent yeah, Mission yeah, of Argentina yeah, to the United Nations in New York. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Mejia, Excellency, colleagues and friends. Uh, first, I would like to thank UNITAR for having organized this very important event. And, and also I would like to thank you for the invitation to be a speaker at this distinguished panel. It is an honor for me to share this uh, panel with such distinguished speakers on this very, very timely and crucial topic on COVID-19 and its impact on the inclusion of older persons. Today in my presentation, I would like to, to talk specifically about COVID-19 and its impact on older workers. And why is it that older workers matter? Well, uh, Mr. Mejia and, Mejia and Minister Gallegos have already clearly pointed out in, the, in their presentations, uh, the demographic trends. And by 2050, one in six people in the world will be aged 65 years old or over, up from one in 11 in 2019. Survival beyond the age of 65 is also improving in most parts of the world, and projections show that such an increase will affect all countries within the next three decades. Um, in most economic models, older persons are categorized as dependent, with the assumption that all people of the age of 60 years and older consume more resources than they produce through their uh, own labor. However, we know that older entrepreneurs make up a sizable portion of all entrepreneurs worldwide. And they also tend to start businesses at a rate that is comparable to or even higher than younger entrepreneurs. Older workers tend to have better networks and higher capacities to evaluate risks, which can help them to be successful entrepreneurs. The impact of population aging is already visible in labor force participation trends, with data showing that employment rates among older persons at the global level have increased by almost 10 percent points in recent three decades. Many older persons continue to work and recognize by performing unpaid care work. Also, many are engaging in the informal economy, which continues to play a significant role in the global labor market. Worldwide, three out of four older persons are in, for, in informal employment. They often enter the informal economy not by choice, but as a result of lack of opportunities in the formal economy and the absence of other means of livelihood. This is often due to non-existent or inadequate benefits provided by pension systems, because of which older persons have to work well into old age to sustain themselves and their families. Uh, the crisis of COVID-19 has exposed existing inequalities in the realm of work. The virus is not just threatening the lives and safety of older persons, but it's also threatening their social networks, their access to health services, their pensions and their jobs. Workers in the informal economy have been identified as being among the most vulnerable, with older persons also recognized among the group's hardest hit by the pandemic in the domain of work. 
older persons who face a significantly higher risk of mortality, severe disease, and longer recovery time following COVID-19 infection may see their economic challenges increase as a result of the pandemic. The COVID-19 crisis has also highlighted the importance of establishing strong social protection systems that support and strengthen the resilience of the entire population. So in designing an immediate response to the COVID-19 emergency, we should not miss out on the opportunity to also take a long-term perspective and develop strategies that strengthen social protection systems and crisis preparedness. We heard from the distinguished speakers before me that the pandemic has had and continues to have a disproportionate and severe impact on older persons, their health, rights, and well-being. The independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons, Ms. Claudia Mahler, mentioned in her last report that the pandemic has not only shown the chronic invisibility of the gaps in the international legal frameworks for the protection of the human rights of older persons, but it has also shown that we are leaving them behind. Also, the Secretary General highlighted the dire effects of COVID-19 on older persons in his policy brief on this issue launched last May. He pointed out that the absence of a dedicated internationally agreed legal framework contributes to the vulnerability of older persons and may have contributed at times to inadequate responses to the COVID-19 crisis. In this regard, the Secretary General recommended building stronger legal frameworks at national and international levels to protect the human rights of older persons, including by accelerating the efforts of the open-ended working group on aging to develop proposals for an international legal instrument to promote and protect the rights and dignity of older persons. Argentina was one of the eight countries who joined a cross-regional core group that coordinated and led a strong statement of support signed by 150 uh, sorry, and 46 member states who are committed to the policy framework presented by the Secretary General in his brief on the impact of COVID-19 on older persons. Additionally, we see that the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Ms. Michelle Bachelet, has also highlighted in her statement at the 10th session of the Open-Ended Working Group on Aging that, and I'm quoting, when it comes to older persons, the current legal and policy framework at both the national and international levels remain grossly inadequate and inconsistent. Existing international human rights instruments are silent on older persons. As a consequence, older persons remain invisible in the recommendations of the UN human rights mechanisms of more than 13,000 recommendations regarding discrimination adopted by these bodies, less than 1% concern older persons. She also stressed that a dedicated convention would provide coherent coherence to an otherwise fragmented and even an incomplete landscape legal norms. And it would also put in place monitoring mechanisms for accountability and redress to ensure the implementation of measures to protect, respect, and fulfill the human rights of older persons. Also, we recognize when looking ahead uh, that the Secretary General said in his report to the General Assembly this year that COVID-19 has moved us into a future that demands for us to rethink the labor market, provide an opportunity to harness the potential of, of longevity and benefit from the participation of older persons on the path to economic recovery. The permanent representative of Argentina, Ambassador Maria del Carmen Esquef, has the honor to hold the chairmanship of the General Assembly Open-Ended Working Group on Aging. And in our upcoming session, the membership will discuss the right to work and access to labor markets as it relates to older people. We anticipate that these discussions will address the adverse impact of discrimination and inequalities experienced by older persons in employment. We should all work to make visible the contributions that older persons already make to our societies and combat stereotypes that show older persons as less productive or unable to learn and adapt to new technologies. To conclude, I would like to point out that it's really time that we all recognize both the social and economic contributions that older persons make, and we should all embrace the potential of an aging population as a basis for future development. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, to you. 
Uh, Maria Florencia, uh, quite a, a, a very uh, uh, unique perspective, as I say, two comments, if I may, and then we'll open the floor uh, for some questions, uh, interesting questions that we have received. Number one, thank you indeed for calling the attention to the open-ended working group on aging. Uh, I think uh, 11 years uh, of work since its creation at the end of 2010 and um, uh, raising awareness about this mechanism important indeed. But the second one, it's also quite unique um, that you have called um, uh, our attention to the need uh, on the need to address the gaps of legal frameworks. Um, if I may say, and this is a conversation uh, in an amicable manner, and it's not a technical group, the, all the legal frameworks that we have uh, in a multilateral architecture nationally um, in, 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 and at every level within governments are obsolete. I wanna say that uh, respectfully because they were created for another reality. And as we have discussed today, the demographics is not a matter of, uh, of, of, of a possibility. It's a, a reality that will happen in 2030, in 2050, as you say, and so, so it's going to happen. So those legal frameworks must be adapted to the realities of today and, and the near future. So thank you so much uh, for bringing our attention to that and for the job that you do out of New York uh, as part of the open-ended uh, working group. Um, with that, let me um, open the floor for some questions. And the first one I would like to address uh, to Ambassador Feruki, uh, giving me her expertise uh, and, and very illustrious career, as I mentioned before. Excellency, we have a, a question from Mr. Jorge Miranda um, on aging and COVID-19. The question is as follows. Are you considering the consequences of stigma and discrimination related to the vulnerability of older persons regarding COVID-19 in the job market worldwide? So how stigma and discrimination are affecting the job market and the job opportunities of elder people? Excellency, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Alex. I think, yes, there was, because since the apparition of this uh, miserable virus, I have to say, I think the elders were, how I can say, pointed up or pointed like the cluster for the spread of the virus. Maybe because of their vulnerability, this is true. But I don't think also that in the portion of the elders, all are equal. I think there is a lot of differences there because there are, you can find people who are in excellent shape, those who are very ill, this is true, and those who are in the middle, but not all of them. But suddenly it appears that the elders were looked at, how I can say, maybe stigmatized by the virus. I think this is a reality. And look at those who, even in the, their death, nobody could, from their families, could be present at their death. This is, I think, the most horrible thing that we can imagine. Now, on the labor market, as you know, the virus showed also two, how I can say, two situations. One of the flexibility, opening the door for the telework, you see, through the new technologies. But on the other hand, you have also those who are working in other services that it could not at all deliver through new technologies, like industry, like, uh, uh, how I can say, uh, all the restaurants, bars, cafes, etc. And in that way, because of the stigma the elders were facing, I think the first who were put immediately on leave were precisely the elders. I think there is a discrimination, although it is maybe initially not meant as a direct policy against them, it was maybe because of nobody had the right or the adequate approach on how to protect the most vulnerable of among us and taking into consideration 
the vulnerabilities of the elders, I think the, uh, how I can say, the efforts was put on them, but with a lot of damage. This is the, the reality also. Then discrimination, I think it is there, and as, as said just by Maria Florencia, I think it is true through the figures she gave to us that there is, beside the virus or even outside of the virus, there was a trend also for this kind of discrimination against elders, considered that less productive, less, etc. No? All the uh, negative appreciation regarding the elders. But I think they can offer a lot. If we open the, the, the box for that, we can maybe comment on that. But in my opinion, in my husband's opinion, there is, there was a discrimination against elders. It is now, I think everybody was now is conscious that we damaged a lot of our elders, that we are now trying maybe to adjust or to balance a little bit the approaches that were initially adopted. But this is the reality, this is the sad reality of the COVID, frankly speaking, exacerbated by the COVID against elders. What? Exactly. Very good, very good. Uh, thank you for sharing those, those views uh, indeed on what uh, remains um, uh, uh, something to be addressed because the issue of this pandemic, right, is that it has brought almost the total attention of the world and the governments included um, to the health crisis proper. And there are other social issues that are still important and urgent, but perhaps they became secondary because we understand the, the priority should be to prevent uh, 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 the expansion of the pandemic and to save people's lives. But as Ambassador Faruqi is saying, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this remains uh, something that the world should be uh, looking at. Let me have the, the last two questions uh, that we have received. The first one for Dr. Carla. A few years back, um, a person uh, had attended, I'm going to talk about gender now, the perspective of gender uh, from the point of view of this analysis. Uh, there was a, a, a workshop on uh, neglect, abuse, and violence of older women. What have we learned so far after all these years? I, I don't know how many years ago this is, but I understand that the UN uh, uh, covered that. Neglect, abuse, and violence of older women. And the question is, uh, perhaps from the experience of Brazil, do you see a dichotomy between the situation of older persons, male and female. What's the gender perspective, Dr. Carla? Yes, uh, it's very, it's very. I, I, I'm not sure it's very clear, but uh, uh, the vulnerability of the the female is is in the old age is big for us you can see more uh, external cause of violence and uh, I think yeah we we have a, a more difficult to to female but uh, uh, we, we have a female uh, yeah women with better capacity functional capacity in 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 the old age, and the and 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 the people who uh, can uh, have to to do many external uh, activities, and uh, we have more um, yeah more males with uh, COVID contaminate, uh, but uh, the attentions for the family is 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 better for the female for the. They will, but uh, they suffer more violence uh, if you compare for the men at the home. Yeah, I, I think the we have many points to 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 see about that. But uh, yeah, it is is clear for us that uh, in Brazil, uh, uh, women have more uh, um, violence and uh, bad. Uh, not better uh, place to to consider 
Yeah, I think that we have many difficulties to to mm -hmm. analyze this. Yes, I'm not sure if you're clear, but uh, there's a, a, a lot of uh, cows to understand this. Yes, yeah. yes, and I do, I do understand. And thank you for confirming our question uh, because the assumption of, of, of this uh, uh, original question is exactly that, that there is indeed a gender perspective when it comes to, to aging. Uh, and, and of course, yes. there, and the case of Brazil shows that. Let me now know, go to the last uh, question. Uh, to Ms. Maria Florencia Gonzalez, uh, who perhaps uh, has uh, this uh, internal view of the multilateral architecture that uh, will allow her to give us even more light. The question is, what should governments do specifically to modify the legal framework in a way that will ensure that older persons will have better rights and better protection? What should governments do, Maria Florencia? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Alex Mejia. Well, what a question. <laughs> it's a very interesting question, and it's a question that we should all be uh, making ourselves. All um, First of all, I think that governments should listen to uh, older persons. Uh, mayor of Malaga, uh, the mayor of Malaga mentioned uh, the, the importance of participation, right, of in, in his presentation, and really it was very, very interesting that point. I think that it's uh, crucial to listen to, to older persons, to listen to what they have to say, to listen to their specific needs, uh, because they are the ones who most know about their rights. Uh, and so I think that uh, first uh, policymakers and governments and, and all main stake, all the stakeholders, we should all listen to them. Uh, this is my, my first um, uh, answer to this question. And, and then of course, uh, we need the, the political will um, uh, to, to, to advance. Uh, to advance the protection and, and, and the promotion and the full realization of all human rights of all older persons. So uh, how we should move forward, it's a process that we should construct together with constructive dialogue, debates, uh, cooperation uh, among different countries. All the international community should get involved uh, in this and have a meaningful and constructive discussion on how we should move forward to advance on this issue. But basically having in mind uh, the, the basis, uh, the focus on, on listening to what older people need. This is my impression. I hope I have answered some, some part at least of your question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I will, and, and I would also would like to point out another important issue that when it comes to older persons that have to, that has to do with uh, addressing the uh, multiple and intersecting form of, forms of discrimination that older people face, right? Uh, well, as uh, Carla uh, very well pointed out, uh, the question of we, we should all also work on, 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 on the specifically ways of discrimination that suffer, forms of discrimination that, and violence that suffer, uh, for example, older women, uh, indigenous older persons, uh, older persons with disabilities, uh, yes. older LGBTI older persons. So addressing this uh, is really of key importance as well. So I, I would just wanted to share this with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, because uh, that is the beginning of it all. If we expect to see this holistic uh, 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 change in national governments, it has to begin by listening to the stakeholders and to, uh, in this case, uh, people of age. Uh, aging is a problem that involves us all, not only senior people. So the government has a role to do that. And what better way to start that process for a new architecture, for new public policy, for new funding, for new specialized institutions, than to listen. Uh, without that, without the input from the stakeholder, nothing should happen. So thank you for that, Maria Florencia. And now, I haven't told her before, but in the one minute and a half that we have, <laughs> I would like to ask you, Excellency Ambassador Ferruki, if you can give us some uh, closing remarks. I have always respected uh, your holistic view as a, a career ambassador for so many decades in so many countries and so successfully, a, a, a beautiful career uh, that you continue to, 
to advance and to grow. So can you give us some uh, last comments uh, so our participants can perhaps remember now that we are going to close? The floor is yours. Yeah, oh, thank you so much, Alex. And thank you for your kind words. Now, I have to first to note that I think UNITAR is taking the lead also on this complex issue related to the inclusion of elders, frankly speaking, because the webinar testifies that it is also following very closely this important issue. Now, uh, having said so, I do agree that international cooperation is needed for a change. The COVID, I think, is offering us a good opportunity to open our minds and to push for political will, really, to help the open-ended group, which is, I think, chaired by Argentina, but also all those who are working on the uh, issue of elders related issues, really, to help governments adapting their public policy. Because if there is no adaptation of public policy to the new trend of population aging globally, is not only for one country. This is why international cooperation is needed. And in this context, I see an excellent niche for UNITA to continue its leadership on this important question, which is of interest to all of us because it's multifaceted. It has gender perspective. It has uh, also uh, human rights perspective. It has also all the legal frame of uh, uh, international uh, labor, etc. And it has a lot of implications. Without, I think, a UN frame or international framework, we cannot also make, unless we leave it to everybody and there, is, there will be no consensus, we do need this consensus to flow from the north to the south and from the south to the north. I think we need it absolutely because we are all humankind. We need it. If there is a progress, we need it all. This is my last word. Thank you. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much. What a beautiful way uh, uh, to wrap up all what we have discussed here today. And with that, uh, on behalf of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, my Assistant Secretary General, Mr. Nikhil Seth, and of course, the Chairman of our World Trustees Ambassador. Luis Gallegos, that was with us. I would like to thank the panelists, particularly Ambassador Ferruki, Mayor de la Torre, Dr. Carla, and Ms. Valle Florencia Gonzalez for uh, sharing their views and benefiting us all. And to my own team, Ms. Julia, again, thank you, Julia, for putting us together. You always do a great job. With that, dear friends, we wish you the best. Blessings to all, and we declare this webinar adjourned. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you.